Hey everybody, let's talk about transverse magnetic polarization in the parallel plate waveguide. So you see I've drawn here the, the typical dimensions for a parallel plate waveguide. I have a perfect electrical conductor on the bottom and the top separated by a distance of D. And as always, my longitudinal direction down the waveguide is Z. My transverse direction is Y. And then coming into or out of the page is my X coordinate. So to have a right-handed system, it would have to go into the page. So what you could do is say, here's a vector. You put a little X there to indicate the tail. And this is my X hat direction. So right-handed system. So what I need now is a solution to the Helmholtz equation acting on the H fields rather than the E field. And I need that solution to specifically satisfy boundary conditions on this waveguide. Now, if you remember from partial differential equations and as we did in the previous uh, polarization, there isn't really any specific way to go from here to the correct solution. You kind of just have to guess what you think the solution might look like and see what just sort of mathematically falls out. And if it happens to satisfy the boundary conditions, then you know you have stumbled onto the correct solution. So with the benefit of a lot of trial and error and some hindsight, I'm going to assume the following solution. My H field is a function of Y and Z. It's going to be polarized along the X hat direction. So that's where we get this idea of transverse magnetic because it is transverse to the direction of propagation. And then I'm going to say the following, A, E to the plus J gamma Y plus B E to the minus J gamma Y times E to the minus J beta Z. <clears throat> so you remember, this basically is assuming a superposition of two waves. I have one plane wave, plane wave going in this direction, like so. And then I have another plane wave going the opposite direction. And if I add those two together, hopefully I can figure out certain conditions that will satisfy the boundaries along this waveguide. So in particular, I'm going to need my electric field to be zero and zero along uh, the top and the bottom of this wave. So <clears throat> this thing here satisfies the Helmholtz equation, but I can't necessarily pick and choose these coefficients arbitrarily. They need to be chosen such that I am able to satisfy the boundary conditions. However, we can at least say, because of the Helmholtz equation here, that K naught squared is equal to beta squared plus gamma squared. So that's the relationship between these coefficients as determined by the Helmholtz equation. And if it helps, you can think of this as the x and y coordinates, or sorry, the x, the y and z coordinates of my wave number here, right? So there, there is some wave number k, and it will have z and y components of that right triangle. But of course we know we're gonna have some subscript ends coming along, so I kind of prefer to use this beta and gamma notation here. So just kind of think of these as interchangeable, depending on uh, which notation you find to be a little cleaner. So what do we do now? Well, I don't really have boundary conditions on the magnetic field per se, but I do know what the electric field must satisfy. So we're going to invoke Ampere's law, where del cross h is equal to j omega epsilon naught times e. So this is Ampere's law without any sources. So normally, if, if there were sources around, you would include a current density term, but there, there are no sources in this system. So we're just gonna ignore that guy. And this is going to help me solve for uh, my electric field here. So remember <clears throat> that the curl of h if I have just an x component, so you do a table lookup, you will get something that looks like the following. Partial h with respect to z, y hat, minus partial h. So I guess uh, these are scale the x components here of my h field. So that, that's, not, that's a scalar field, not a vector. With respect to y times z hat. That is the curl of this H if there's only an X component to my field here. Okay, so the implication then is if I divide 
by this term here, j omega epsilon naught, one over j omega epsilon naught, I would have just the E field. So let's write that out now. So my E field is a function of y comma z is equal to one over j omega epsilon naught times all of this stuff here. So I'm gonna start with the y hat. You notice if I just take the derivative with respect to z, all of these two terms here are unchanged. All I get is a j beta, a negative j beta in front. So I'll get a minus j beta times all of this stuff here, which is actually my hx, but let's write it out anyway. So I'll get a a e to the plus j gamma y plus b e to the minus j gamma y. And I'm gonna actually factor out this term on the edge. So it's gonna be there, but I'm gonna use a little foresight here. And then I'm going to get a negative over here. <clears throat> and I have to do, take the derivative with respect to y. So you'll notice I have these complex exponentials. So a j gamma is going to come out here, j gamma, like so. This term is unaffected, a e to the plus j gamma y, but this is going to have a negative sign on it because of that little term here, minus b e to the minus j gamma y. And then I'm gonna factor this guy out here, e to the minus j beta z. So it's tagged on both of these. So I have my, and of course there is a uh, z hat here. So don't forget that this is a vector now. So there's a y component and a z component on my electric field. <clears throat> so first thing first, you notice I got a bunch of j's here. So that means we can do a little bit of simplification. So that j and that j and that j are all gonna go away because I've divided it out. And what we're basically going to get is the following. I'm gonna write this out as basically e sub x, or sorry, excuse me, e sub y is gonna be as a function of y comma z, y hat plus e sub z as a function of y and z, z hat here. So just remember, this is the scalar field corresponding to these little terms. So if we sort of lump all of this, this is gonna be this term here. And then all of this stuff over here is gonna to correspond to that little scalar field. There. So to write it out a little more explicitly, e sub y of y comma z is equal to, I'm gonna have a negative beta over omega epsilon naught. So just bear with me as we do some algebra here. We'll have a e to the plus j gamma y plus b e to the minus j gamma y e to the minus j beta z. So that's the y component on my electric field or the transverse. And then we'll have a z component here, y comma z is equal to. So there's a net, another negative gamma here. So negative gamma over omega epsilon naught. And there's, you'll notice some patterns here, e to the plus j gamma y minus b e to the minus j gamma y e to the minus j beta z. So we just kind of written this out a little more explicitly here. So the next step, we need to apply boundary conditions. And there are basically only two conditions we care about. Obviously the first is my tangential electric field must be zero at this part of the waveguide and it must be zero up here. So the tangential, you notice this is the tangential component of my electric field, and then this is the normal component. So the boundary condition is only going to affect this term here. So I'm gonna say E sub Z at zero comma Z is equal to zero. That's my first boundary condition. And then of course, E sub Z at D comma Z is equal to zero. So these are the two boundary conditions I must apply. Okay, so let's start with our first boundary condition. So I'm gonna write out E sub Z of zero comma Z is equal to this guy here, minus gamma over omega epsilon 
a, I'm going to put in a zero, so I just get a minus b, e to the minus j beta z. And this whole thing has to equal zero. So you notice the only way that can really happen is if this term here in the middle is zero, because that divides out and that divides out, but this guy does not, because neither of these terms can be guaranteed to be zero for all values of z. So the implication is a is equal to b. In other words, I'm not free to arbitrarily pick and choose which coefficients go where. I have to satisfy this condition. So what does that immediately imply? Well, remember my h of y comma z had an x hat. I had this term here. So if a equals b, this whole thing becomes a cosine. So a equals b implies this is a cosine of gamma y, this, this whole thing here. And technically there's, there's a coefficient here, there, there's like a 2j or whatever comes out, but we're going to lump it all into that leading coefficient at the end of the day. So in other words, what you get is 2a cosine gamma y, but 2 times an arbitrary constant is an arbitrary constant. So we, we don't keep track of that sort of thing when we're looking for the general solutions. So what I'll get here is essentially, let's just call this uh, a cosine gamma y e to the minus j beta z. Okay, <clears throat> we also find that my ey is going to be negative beta over omega epsilon naught. And the same argument applies. I have this complex exponentials here. When a equals b, this turns into a cosine, and the, the all the scalars out front lump into each other to create a new arbitrary constant. And I just get a cosine gamma y e to the minus j beta z. But my z component is going to be a little special. e sub z is equal to. Now I have a minus sign here, so in this that means Euler's identity says this whole thing has to turn into a, I believe it's 2j sine gamma y or 2 over j, that sort of thing. But this is also an arbitrary constant times a constant, so we'll just leave it as an a times this, excuse me. So this is an arbitrary constant times some other constant gives me an arbitrary constant. So you don't have to be precise with Euler's identity here. You just lump them all into some arbitrary coefficient out front. And so I'm left with negative gamma over omega epsilon naught a sine of gamma y e to the minus j beta z. So again, you're being, it's, it's okay to be a little fast and loose with Euler's identity here because those coefficients just get sort of absorbed into each other to create yet another coefficient. So that was our first boundary condition. Our second boundary condition was simply e sub z at d comma z is also equal to zero, the top end of the plate. So I'm going to get negative gamma over omega epsilon naught times a times sine of gamma d e to the minus j beta z is equal to zero. So once again, these coefficients cannot give me a zero unless they're already zero, which is trivial. This guy here cannot guarantee a zero for all values of z, so that doesn't matter. And I'm left with just this term here. So in other words, you get gamma d is equal to the arc sine of zero. And you should notice this should look very familiar here. This leads us to this notion of gamma sub n is equal to n pi over d. Okay, so any value of n pi over d here where, of course, n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. Any positive integer is allowed. So this 0 here is going to be a little special, which we'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> So let's start by first reminding ourselves that these are all perfectly viable solutions, which means any linear combination of solutions is also a solution. So I will get h of y comma z is equal to x hat times the summation from n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n cosine of gamma sub n y e to the minus j beta sub n z. 
So that should look very familiar. We get that same sort of Fourier series, only instead of the sign, on, like we had on the electric fields, the, the magnetic field here for Tm will be a cosine. And it's also important to keep in mind at the back of your head that these coefficients have units of amps per meter. So when it was electric field, they were volts per meter. Now we're defining it through the magnetic field, which has units of amps per meter. And of course, you do the same thing on the electric fields. You get those, sum, uh, those summations as well. And remember in the back of your head that k naught squared is equal to beta sub n squared plus gamma sub n squared. Now, something interesting happens is that you'll notice a zero is allowed because I will not get a trivial solution. All that happens is the cosine term here goes into a one. So let's explore that right now. Okay, so let's plug in n equals zero. And that implies the cosine of zero is equal to one. And my magnetic field, I'm gonna write this as h sub zero for the zeroth mode of y comma z is equal to x hat a sub zero e to the minus j beta sub zero times z. Isn't that interesting? You'll also notice that if I put in zero for my uh, n equals zero mode, my z component will go to zero, but my y component will not. I'll get something very similar here. So I will get my e naught, so my zeroth mode, my electric field, will simply be y hat, and then there'll be a negative beta zero over omega epsilon naught, times a sub zero e to the minus j beta sub zero times z. And then of course there's no z component. So this, you'll notice I have propagation along z and I have an x and a y. So both my electric field and my magnetic field are transverse to the direction of propagation. So this is where we get that notion of a TEM wave in a waveguide. It, both transverse electric and transverse magnetic at the same time. So what you can think of is the TEM, wa the TEM wave is basically the zeroth mode of the, tr uh, the transverse magnetic waveguide problem. So I'm gonna write this as TM sub zero. These, these are one and the same thing. The zeroth mode solution gives me the TEM solution, which means there is no lowest frequency of cutoff when we're in transverse magnetic polarization. There is in fact this mode here and it goes, it is, is a viable solution for all frequencies from zero to infinity. Recall also that K naught squared was equal to beta naught squared plus gamma sub zero squared. Well, for N equals zero, this guy goes away and you just get K naught equals beta naught. So everywhere you see a beta naught here, you can actually cross that out and put K naught and K sub zero over here. But remember, k sub zero is omega over c zero, the speed of light in a vacuum, because <clears throat> there's no dielectrics in our waveguide. So what does that imply in my electric field? So I'm gonna write e naught is equal to y hat negative omega over omega epsilon naught c naught times a naught e to the minus j k naught z. So you notice a few things are gonna happen here. The omegas are gonna cancel and C naught, C sub zero, remember C sub zero is one divided by the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. So this leading coefficient here will simplify into simply the square root of mu naught over epsilon naught. So isn't that interesting times a naught here. <clears throat> so for convenience, instead of using a, because it makes a more sense to think of a when you're doing the infinite summation. When we're doing just kind of the zero uh, mode here, it's gonna be a little more helpful to, to think of this as you know an h sub zero, like a, a magnetic field intensity. So what we'll get is the magnitude of my electric field is going to be the magnitude of my magnetic field times the square root 
of mu naught over epsilon naught. So that, that's just a naught here, but I'm being a little more explicit. But that little uh, coefficient here has a name that is the intrinsic impedance of free space. So what you'll get is eta sub zero times h naught. Or in other words, if you want to be a little more explicit, the ratio of e naught over h naught is in fact the intrinsic impedance. So that's a nice sort of interesting thing that pops out there is you can think of the this wave has this particular impedance associated with it, even though the other modes do not. Okay, so that is the n equals zero mode. <clears throat> So for n is not equal to zero, we have the transverse magnetic polarization because the ma magnetic field is transverse to the direction of propagation, but not the E field. So in summary, we'll have my H of Y comma Z is going to be X hat from n equals one to infinity. And you can say A sub n or H sub n. I kind of like to say A sub n um, and we'll say cosine gamma sub n y e to the minus j beta sub n z. And then I'll have my electric field y comma z. And we're going to write this as kind of a, a piecewise function. So I'm actually going to need a little bit more space. So let's, let's do it down here. y comma z is equal to negative some n equals zero, uh, 1 to infinity. And we will get a sub n over omega epsilon naught. And we're going to have a e to the minus j beta sub n z. And then there will be a piecewise function out here where it's going to say y hat beta sub n cosine gamma sub n y. And then the other piece of it, my z direction, will be this gamma n sine gamma sub n y. So that is the total electric field. So you notice I've factored out all of these little common terms and just sort of emphasize the differences uh, for the polarization. Okay, so that is the complete solution for the electric and magnetic fields with transverse magnetic, not the transverse electromagnetic, where of course, k naught squared is equal to beta sub n squared plus gamma sub n squared, and gamma sub n is n pi over d. And we still now, once again, get that notion of a mode cutoff. So if you do the math, you find the same issue where the mode cutoff for any given frequency is going to be n times c naught over 2d. So that's just what happens when you do that same analysis to get the real and imaginary, <coughs> imaginary components. So just a reminder, My, my longitudinal propagation constant has to satisfy this condition. This guy can tick up and down, but depending on my value of n, and as long as I have a real value here in the square root, I get a propagating mode, and if this guy gets bigger than this guy, I get cutoff, which will be satisfied here. So it's a little bit of straightforward algebra to jump from here to here. So that whole cutoff notion still applies just like we saw before, that every single mode has a lower cutoff frequency associated with it, but, for the transverse magnetic co uh, for the transverse magnetic polarization, I can go all the way down to n and still have a non-trivial solution, and which means my lowest absolute lowest cutoff frequency for my zeroth mode is in fact zero hertz. So there is no lower bound for that particular polarization. But there you go. That's it. That is the transverse magnetic polarization in a parallel plate waveguide.